John, why don't we get started? It's 7.31. A lot of people are on the call already. Other people will join, but I think we have a packed morning. Yes, welcome everyone. I'm excited for this morning. I think we have a, a great session. We have two of our uh, most fabulous neuro-ophthalmology teachers here, along with three of our junior residents to present. I'll just briefly tell you about uh, Drs. Margolin and uh, Michelli. Dr. Margolin did his residency at McGill, followed by his fellowship at the University of Michigan. He's an associate professor in our department, also on staff at Mount Sinai and Western. He teaches uh, residents in both ophthalmology and neurology and is winner of numerous teaching awards. And he lectures both nationally and internationally. He's involved, very involved in the North American Neuroophthalmology Society. Dr. Michelli contributed his residency here at Toronto, followed by his fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology at Emory in Atlanta, Georgia. He's an assistant professor in our department and is also very interested in teaching at all levels. <clears throat> Jonathan has published uh, a case-based neuro-ophthalmology book of multiple choice questions and explanations for ophthalmology and neurology residents. He's also very active in research and presenting. So please welcome our two uh, <clears throat> uh, mentors and our resident presenters today. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I would want to thank everybody for um, getting up so early to listen to us um, about this topic that I'm sure have been on our minds for at least the last year and a half. As you know, this new coronavirus has been part of our lives for the last year and a half. And uh, medically speaking, we as ophthalmologists were largely left on the sidelines in terms of actually caring for the patients with COVID. However, we've all seen some sequela of it in our patients. I was looking up at the statistics last night and uh, it's kind of staggering to see that the confirmed COVID infections have been documented now in 235 million people worldwide, with of course the actual number probably many times higher than that. And uh, 4.8 million people are now dead as a direct result of being infected with coronavirus. So that's the toll that is pretty close to approaching the Holocaust soon. Um, these numbers are obviously hard to fathom. However, what's even harder to fathom are the billions of people, including all of us here, who have been indirectly affected by the pandemics in all aspects of our lives. So what we wanted to do, Dr. Michelle and myself, we wanted to share with you the cases of patients with both direct neuroophthalmic sequela of COVID infection and those who have suffered really indirect neuroophthalmic consequences of the pandemic. So remember, we were not going to be just showing you the cases, patients who had COVID and uh, then had neuroophthalmic sequela. Now, our rounds are by no means inclusive, but simply a potpourri of instructive cases, all with a take-home message. And... Um, before we even begin, I want to thank all of the residents who worked very hard in preparing their cases and our outgoing fellow, Dr. Laura Donaldson, who has been really an integral part of most of the cases we'll show you today. We only have one hour to present you four cases and a little short post-test at the end. So I'll ask you to save all your questions and post them in the, in the chat and we will answer all of them. So just please keep posting your questions, we'll keep answering them. And uh, we will invite um, Safwan to share his screen and start his presentation. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks again for tuning into rounds today. And before starting, I would like to again, thank Dr. Donaldson and Dr. Margolin for their help in preparing this presentation. So uh, since the theme of the rounds today is how COVID-19 affected us, I would like to share a personal story of how COVID-19 affected me personally. So living in Toronto, and Toronto being one of the cities of the longest lockdown in North America and maybe the whole world, and with gyms and sporting facilities being shut down in Toronto for almost one full year, that was a very good reason for me to live a very sedentary lifestyle over the past year. And probably the most strenuous activity I have been doing is just walking from home to clinics to inpatient wards. That's it. So finally, July 14, 2021, and Toronto to enter stage three of free opening and gyms and sporting facilities are finally open. So I decided to celebrate this with friends by playing our favorite game, soccer without giving any consideration to my level of stamina over the past year. 
It was a great game and we most certainly won, which is most important. However, next day I truly regretted this decision as I can feel the pain and ache at every muscle of my body and I can barely see my way. So with that, let's start our case presentation. It's December 2020 and it's the peak of the second wave of COVID in Ontario. This six to six years old women with the usual past medical history present to one of the community eMERGE uh, department with acute fever and shortness of breath. And you don't need to be an internist to say that this chest X-ray does not look that good. You can we see here there is definitely hyperinflation, um, um, uh, peripheral infiltrate, uh, airway edema, and this is what we see in COVID. And sure enough, her PCR came back positive for SARS-CoV-2 virus, as known as COVID-19. So her hospital course, at the beginning of her hospitalization, she actually did not do that well. So she required intubation and very extended stay in the ICU. She developed bacterial superinfection. And fortunately enough, she did not suffer from major hemodynamic events, but she was mildly hypertensive in ICU. Fortunately, things took turn for improvement and she was uh, slowly getting better at, the, um, at her hospitalization. And now it's finally the day she is actually out of the ICU and her family members are uh, invited to come and see her. And when she regained consciousness, this is the first thing she said, I cannot see you. She was not able to recognize her family members. So what's going on here? Is it just delirium? Um, this is the first thought that came to her internal medicine and ICU uh, treating physicians. She certainly have multiple risk factors for that, extended ICU stay and familiar environment. She's been in tons of medication. However, she was able to recognize her family members by just listening to their voices. And this is unusual because usually uh, confused people cannot do that. So what's going on here? Such a ophthalmology consult was requested. She had very poor vision, she just counting fingers in each eye, but her eye exam was in no eye. Okay, so let's take a step back and review the differential diagnosis of acute to subacute bilateral vision loss with normal eye exam, because this is a fairly common situation that we honestly as residents face either during home calls or inpatient rounds, and it can be puzzling and it's always helpful here to think of localization before thinking of differential diagnosis. So it can be certain macular disease, certain macular conditions, such as autoimmune retinopathy, cancer-associated retinopathy, have very subtle findings and can be easily missed. And uh, you need to have high index of suspicion for these. And what's helpful here is to try to arrange the patient to come to the clinic for uh, OCT macular assessment, just to rule out any macular pathology. Certainly, you should think of disorders that affect the papillomacular bundle, toxic hereditary nutritional and metabolic um, optic neuropathies, and this will be discussed later during rounds today, so I won't uh, elude much into it. Uh, certainly, it can be bilateral symmetric retrobarbar optic neuropathy, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is a quite rare diagnosis and it's exclusively happen in three situations, either post-surgical patients or patients with massive uh, uh, blood loss and uh, significant hypertension. And finally, in the context of GCA, um, you should consider a typical optic neuritis such as NMO, MOG, and others. And uh, finally, infiltrative optic neuropathy, especially in COVID patients, because these patients are usually immunosuppressed and being treated with high dose of steroids. So they're certainly at high risk of developing fungal infections. Uh, fungal uh, fungal um, sinusitis and fungal optic nerve infiltration. Um, and then acute chiasmal compression with pituitary apoplexy with certain masses with aneurysms. And sometimes these patients would have um, associated cranial neuropathies. And then you should think of visual cortex, especially if the symptoms are symmetric in both eyes. You should think of visual cortex disorders. And finally, once we roll out all conditions of the visual pathway, we should consider functional vision loss. So let's go back to our patient. What test would you order next? And um, MND, if you can launch the polling questions, then we're going to give uh, 20 seconds for the audience to answer. Is it uh, ERG, lumbar puncture, CT scan of the brain, or MRI of the brain? Thank you, Safon. We'll just give us another few seconds to run and I'll launch the results. Sure. Pretty overwhelming, so I might end it early here. Perfect. There you go. 
Okay, so amazing and great that everyone is right in the ball here. So see, certainly we ordered MRI in the brain for her. So this is her MRI of the brain. And we have three sequences here. This is 2 2 flare sequence, which is the sequence that we use to look for inflammatory conditions of the brain. And this is a diffusion weighting imaging and ADC map, which is a sequence that quite sensitive to acute ischemic events in the brain. And the idea here is that in the acute ischemic events, water and hydrogen ion won't diffuse freely into ischemic areas. So these areas will appear dark quite early in ischemia. Here we see there is certainly extensive 2-2 uh, hyperintensities in the posterior fossa, but these areas are actually bright in ADC map or and uh, diffusion weighting imaging, which is mean that the cells are not ischemic. And the issue here is not with ischemic cells, it's more of the blood-brain barrier. And this is what we call vasogenic edema. And this is the radiologists like to call this picture, T2 shine through. In this clinical radiological syndrome, this is what we call press. So what's press? posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. It's a disorder of endothelial dysfunction and can result in uh, vasogenic edema, as we mentioned. Uh, so the occipital and parietal lobes are the most commonly affected just because the blood vessels in these loops have no receptors. So they're not able to autoregulate blood flow. So, so they're very vulnerable to changes in blood pressure. It, has, it can present with variety of symptoms, sometimes headache, altered level of consciousness, vision loss and seizures. And it has been reported in a variety of conditions, acute rise in blood pressure, in post-transplant patient, patient taking um, uh, uh, autoimmune medications, or um, in a context of uh, eclampsia. So let's review the press specific radiological uh, appearance. Uh, it's a vasogenic edema rather than cytotoxic edema. It's an issue of the um, blood-brain barrier. It's an extracellular edema rather than intracellular edema. And in press, there is no restrictive diffusion of of uh, there is no restricted diffusion and there is increased signal in ADC map. This is in context the cases of stroke or in cases of like multiple sclerosis or radiation necrosis, where you will be like restricted diffusion of water and restricted and decreased signal in ADC map. So four weeks later, COVID, her vision returned back to baseline. And here we compared her original MRI with her um, follow-up MRI. And then here we see a very nice resolution of the edema. Um, so present acute COVID-19 have been reported multiple times before from the early days and the early surge of COVID-19 in Italy. And we have aid, added this case to the literature as well. Um, so what can cause present acute COVID-19? There's multiple theories first. As part of the systemic inflammatory condition, multiple cytokines have been um, released, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-2, and others cause endothelial dysfunction. Second is that the COVID virus itself through the spike protein can bind to ACE2 receptors and downregulate the renin angiotensin system. And finally, the medication used in the treatment of COVID, such as hydroxychloroquine and others, can be associated with PRESS. So what are the main takeaways of the today's presentation? That include press and the differential diagnosis of bilateral vision loss with normal exam or with normal eye exam. You might see it next time in post-transplant patients or in the context of um, uh, eclampsia. So just remember this. And finally, press is a reversible cause of vision loss. So please identify it, diagnose it, and treat it. And finally, COVID-19 is uh, potentially an, an independent risk factor for press. Thank you so much. Thank you, Savwan. And again, we will invite everybody to um, to post their questions on the chat. We wanted to present to you this case of something that you might not have been familiar with and something you might not see very much, but something that you should have some familiarity with. So um, again, this in this particular patient, COVID-19 was the only um, known inciting factor for the press. Uh, however, you will see it in clinic more most likely associated with preeclampsia with a very severe hypertension or patients who are taking post-transplant medications. So um, I'll invite then our next panelist to present his case, Kirill. So Ed, as uh, Kirill gets his slides up, just a couple questions in the, in the chat there, just the treatment for press besides treating the underlying disorder. That is the only treatment for press because the treating the underlying disorder will restore potentially this diseased endothelial 
barrier in the, in the occipital slash parietal lobe and uh, reverse this extracellular edema. So we have to stop the fenting medications, treat the hypertension, um, figure out if there is an underlying infection, like in this case, that needs to be treated. Um, so all of this is the, this is the treatment. Perfect, thank you. All right, Kirill, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, this is, a, we're now in wave three of the pandemic, and this is a case that uh, Dr. Donsel helped me prepare. It's a case of sudden blindness. So you encounter a 62-year-old woman in your clinic, and she states that while she was driving, she noticed that she can't quite see out of her right eye, and this has been going on for the past six days. Carefully ask her about jaw claudication, headache, uh, fevers, weight loss, she says no. On examination, indeed, you find that the right eye is count fingers vision and the left eye is 2040. Surprisingly, there is no relative afferent pupillary defect. On your examination, the anterior segment is normal. Continuing forward, you look at the fundus, relatively normal. Nothing here really that jumps out at you. You perform an OCT of the macula again looks very intact there's no obvious destruction of the outer retina you look at the ganglion cell analysis again relatively normal next you perform a visual field your humphrey visual field 24-2 and you can see that in the left eye uh, that's the 2040 eye and the right eye that's the count fingers eye you know non-specific changes and weirdly enough the eye with the worst vision has perhaps a better looking visual field. So with all of this data, do you think she's faking? What would you do next? So the options are you would attempt to fog her at the four-opter, you would order an electroretinogram, you would perform another visual field, or order urgent MRI of the brain and organs with contrast. So I'll give you a couple moments to think about it. So, so Typically, a patient with non-organic visual loss will produce black visual fields. That's not what we see here. So we decided to perform another visual field. So just a quick review, the Humphrey Visual 24-2 algorithm tests only 12 points within 10 degrees of fixation, whereas the 10-2 algorithm tests 68 points within 10 degrees of fixation. When we perform the 10-2 field, now we start to see something interesting. So the eye with count fingers vision, we now see that there is a loss of sensitivity right at fixation, whereas in the eye with 2040 vision, there is loss of sensitivity very close to center of fixation. So that is now perhaps a little bit more compatible with what we're seeing. So now what do we think is going on? So the options are A, atypical optic neuritis, B, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, C, maculopathy, D, functional vision loss, and E, hereditary optic neuropathy. I'll give you a moment again to consider these choices. Think about what we saw in the Humphrey Visual Field 10-2. So this are bilateral sequocentral scotomas, and they suggest a dysfunction of the papillar macular bundle. This is, uh, okay, then, uh, it, these are, this is supported by the ganglion cell supporting the, the central visual, uh, the center of the vision, and uh, they are very metabolically active and they're preferentially, uh, uh, they can be preferentially damaged. So what is a differential diagnosis of bilateral sequocentral scotoma? It's quite short. There's an acquired optic neuropathies and their hereditary optic neuropathies. So acquired optic neuropathies, you know, the, the toxic exposures, such as exposures to metals, say lead, mercury, uh, to solvents, such as ethylene glycol, to methanol probably tobacco, metabolic optic neuropathy, such as uh, vitamin deficiencies. Um, and of course, we have our hereditary optic neuropathy, such as dominant optic atrophy and Lieber's optic hereditary optic neuropathy. All of these seem to converge in a common pathway uh, that uh, suggests that mitochondrial dysfunction that preferentially affects these highly active cells, metabolically active cells in the papillary macular bundle. So now we go back to our patient and we look very carefully at the exam. Actually, when we look at the optic nerves, we do note that there's some bilateral hyperemia, telangiectasia, and mitolevation of optic nerve head. 
We see that on the OCT of the peripapillary RNFL as well, the RNFL is slightly elevated. And then when we look at this patient about six weeks later, now we're starting to see fairly profound nasal, predominantly nasal ganglion cell loss. And vision has now declined. The right eye continues to be count fingers, but the left eye is now 20 to 100. So we order an urgent workup for the causes that we mentioned uh, above. Lab investigations are normal and genetic testing reveals a mitochondrial mutation in the ND1 gene. So the diagnosis here is Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. So let's quickly review what is that. So Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy is one of the most common maternally inherited diseases. Its prevalence is 1 in 30,000, but the carrier rate is fairly high, 1 in 350. Penetrance is 50% in males, about 10% in females, and the onset is about 15 to 35 years of age. So the typical patient is a 15 to 35-year-old male, not the 62-year-old lady that we see here. Genetics are predominantly uh, related to mitochondrial DNA mutations, the most common being the 11778 mutations. Um, and the rest making up uh, with the other mutations listed here. Of note, the 3460 mutation does uh, give patients a chance of about one third chance of recovering vision about one, in about one year. And of course, there's now been a couple of nuclear DNA mutations reported, but this is fairly rare. So in this case, why is there no RAPD? Probably the most simplest uh, explanation is that there's similar extent of visual field loss in both eyes but if you remember in the right eye the visual field loss did affect the very center of the vision and that could explain the count fingers vision and the afferent limb of the pupillary light reflex is carried by these melanopsin expressing intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells that are actually outside the papillar macular bundle and are relatively preserved in Libra's. It also helps if we understand a little bit about the, uh, about the natural history of Liebers. Here you see a, a progression of visual fields, relatively asymmetric progression of sequ bilateral sequocentral scotomas in one of the patients described in a case series by Nancy Newman in 2006. And as you can see here, right before conversion, you can, still f you can find subtle deficits uh, and uh, Humphrey visual field mean deviation, at which point afterwards, once patient converts, really, the visual field rapidly drops off a cliff. When we look at the structure in Lieber's natural history, we find that there are indeed elevations in the RNFL thickness around conversion that then slowly decline. Whereas if we look at the ganglion cell analysis, there's basically a consistent decline as the patients develop disease. So if we go back to our case, we do see that there's an elevation in the RNFL, probably we're around here, and we see that fairly rapid loss for starting with the nasal ganglion, side, uh, ganglion cells first bilaterally and a little bit asymmetric here. So let's go back to our patient. So now we talked, we asked her carefully about her substance consumption habits. And now she does reveal that during the pandemic, she started smoking more and drinking more. Now it was pretty hard to elicit. We actually had to enumerate how many times she would go to LCBO per week and she would make up a few, you know, at least three trips. So drinking significantly increased. And we know uh, that smoking and heavy alcohol use increase the risk of Liebers. They, are both they both interfere with mitochondrial function. We know that there's a dose dependent relationship with smoking and heavy alcohol consumption is associated with, uh, with uh, Liebers. Specifically, binge drinking appears to be uh, particularly important. So why is this important um, for COVID? Now, substance consumption habits during the pandemic and during the lockdown show changes. Lockdown induces a lot of stressors on people. There's social isolation. There's uncertainty about job, uncertainty about the future, boredom. So in Canada, Approximately 20% of people after the first lockdown import, uh, reported increasing their alcohol consumption habits, about 12% decreased. This is also all occurring in a regulatory environment where addiction services and healthcare services are basically interrupted as all resources are reprioritized to COVID care. 
while access to alcohol is expanded, LCBO was an essential service and now you can buy alcohol at the corner store. It's also unknown if trends will correct, continue or worsen as we don't really have a lot of experience with lockdown, but there is some experience with what happens in times of economic crisis. And although the prevalence of drinking might go down, the prevalence of binge drinking does go up. And it's unclear if that changes, if that actually reverts back to normal once conditions, conditions improve. So after the first lockdown in, uh, in the spring of 2020, we published a series of cases of older individuals, two males and one female, where you can see very clear bi bilateral sequocentral scotomas that developed levers due to increased alcohol consumption and smoking. This case is a 62 year old lady and just yesterday in clinic we saw two possible two additional possible cases of 30 of a 35 year old and a 60 year old lady. Now these contrast sharply to the typical Lieber's patient, which is a 15 to 35 year old male, all of these patient, most of these patients at least looks like half are female and all of them are above the age of 35. All of them report increasing alcohol consumption. And so we need to be really, you need to have a, you know, a higher index of suspicion for a hereditary optic neuropathy that is triggered by increased substance consumption uh, in cases of blindness, especially bilateral blindness that we may encounter during the pandemic. So in summary, mitochondrial dysfunction in Libras affects the papillar macular bundle, and that you'll see as bilateral sequocentral scotomas while they may not come out easily on the Humphrey Visual Field 24-2, looking at central, central 10 degrees of fixation with the 10-2 algorithm is particularly helpful, especially early on. We may not see a relative afferent pupillary defect, and this can present in older individuals, especially now in situations where substance consumption habits are significantly changed. Thank you for... Uh, listening and uh, for the opportunity to present. Thank you so much, Kirill, uh, for presenting the case. Uh, the kind of the really interesting part of the case that was, was a very puzzling case in clinic because we very, very rarely see patients with really hyper acute Libras, which is what it was. And there's a question in the chat from Brian Bailey as well was her heteroplasty. It was a homoplasmy. That was 100%. Um, for this lady, um, and um, um, subsequently, obviously, her children got tested, and obviously, they're all carriers of the same mutation. Um, so we will proceed to Jenny, and again, please keep asking your questions in the chat, and we'll answer them all, we promise. Um, Jenny, is that okay? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. yeah. Okay. Um, so my name is Jen. I'm with the two I3s, and I'll be presenting um, my grand rounds titled "A Case of Back Pain." So I'd like to thank Dr. Donaldson, Dr. Lechman, and Dr. Mark Olin for their help on this presentation and with this case. And um, so I want to introduce you to Mrs. B. Mrs. B is a lovely, young, healthy woman. She's active, runs every day, eats right. Um, and she lives in Kitchener with her husband and her two young daughters. Now, they are a bit stressed out when COVID hit, as a lot of families were, but they made the most of it. Uh, her and her family, her and her husband, they work in office jobs for large insurance companies. So they're able to work from home and spend more time with their kids during the pandemic. Now, when the vaccines rolled out earlier this year, her family was very eager to get vaccinated. And as soon as the vaccination spots opened for her and her husband, they signed up. And then they were told that they could get the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, she was just eager to get whatever vaccine was available to her. And so she eagerly got the AstraZeneca vaccine and she received her first dose. The day after, her arm hurt a little bit, but she was otherwise feeling fine. And the next couple of days went back to her regular duties, sort of forgot she had the vaccine. Eight days later, however, and she, she woke up and she was just in excruciating pain. She had this low back pain. Every time she moved, it would hurt. And even if she stayed still, it still really hurt her. She figured just on her run the day before, she probably worked too hard and pulled something. 
Um, and she also woke up with this extreme nausea. She just chalked it up to maybe some bad takeout her family had last night. And she just figured throughout the day it would get better. So she tried to ignore it. But during the day, it just did not go away. And her husband saw that she was in so much pain. You know, she's someone who has a really high pain tolerance. So this was odd for her. Um, and he talked to her and they decided that they would go to the Emerge, but not just their local Emerge in Kitchener. They would drive an hour and a half away, all the way to the Mount Sinai Emerge. She gave birth there and had a wonderful experience at this hospital. And so she figured it would, it would be a really good hospital to go to and a good Emerge to visit for her problem today. So she went through triage and just waited, waited, and waited to be seen. Eventually, she was seen by the Emerge doc. At that time, no investigations were ordered and she was diagnosed with a disc herniation. She was sent home and just told to take over the counter analgesics. She was glad that there wasn't anything more serious going on and just followed their directions and started taking over the counter Tylenol, extra strength, extra strength Tylenol, um, but it just wasn't touching the pain at all. She just figured she just needed a couple more days to get over it. However, two days later, her husband looked at the clock and noticed that it was about noon time. His wife still hadn't woken up. And this was odd for her because she's someone who gets up pretty early to go for her morning run. So he goes to try to wake her up, sort of tries to jostle her awake. Um, she opens her eyes a little bit, closes it, sort of mumbles incoherently. He asks her a question. She's just not making any sense when she's answering. Um, and he gets very concerned about this, so takes her straight to the car and again drives an hour and a half away all the way to the Mount Sinai Emerge. She goes through triage pretty quickly this time just because with the altered LOC, the nurses figured that definitely something was wrong. And at this time investigations are ordered, um, as is normal for most people going through Emerge, just routine blood work gets ordered. And the Emerge doc noticed that the platelets are low which is odd for her given that she's uh, previously healthy, has no medical conditions. And with her altered LOC, they decide to order a CT head, which is surprisingly normal. So the Emerge Dog is sort of perplexed by what's going on. The only abnormalities are the platelets, but she looks very unwell. He remembers that she came in and was also complaining about this bilateral flank pain that she's been having. So he decided, let's just do a pan CT. And that's when they saw a lot of abnormalities. On the CT chest, they saw pulmonary emboli and bilateral pleural effusions. You can see that there by the arrows. Um, on the CT abdomen, she had bilateral hemorrhagic adrenal infarctions, which accounted for her flank pain. She also had a kidney, uh, kit left kidney infarct. And then on the CT pelvis, they saw thrombi in the left common iliac and renal vein. So here's the summary, just all of the abnormalities that were found on the pan CT. Um, the Emerge doc was just thinking about things that were going on then, and he had a one specific diagnosis in mind and decided to order a HIT assay, um, which is a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia assay. And now this looks for antibodies against plate, uh, complexes of platelet factor four and heparin. And it's positive in, in some patients who have been exposed to heparin and have this reaction. It ended up being positive in her, which is odd because she was never exposed to heparin. So just to summarize what we know here, we have this healthy young female now presenting with multiple sites of venous thrombosis throughout her body and a positive HIT assay. Emerge Doc is thinking what could be going on. Um, and then he remembered that she did have the COVID vaccine about a week, week and a half ago. And with all of this information, he diagnosed her with vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VIT, which is a relatively new entity and we'll be talking about it a little bit later on. So with VIT and with the severity of her condition, she was admitted to the ICU and the VIT treatment protocol was started. Um, she was started on anticoagulants, so IV argatroban, which was transitioned to oral rivaroxaban, and they need to start non-heparin anticoagulants for these patients. Uh, she was started on IVIG to inhibit platelet activation. And because of the adrenal hemorrhages and infarctions um, and the ad resulting adrenal insufficiency, she's also started on IV hydrocortisone. The next couple of days, she started to stabilize and things were looking positive. Hopefully she could be transferred to the ward soon. However, four days later, more problems arose. She started complaining about this extreme vertigo, severe headaches, and bilateral blurred vision. Now this was very concerning to the ICU team, so they immediately ordered an urgent MRI 
with venography. And it, it showed very extensive thromboses of multiple dural venous sinuses. And it, they also saw that she had a stroke in her cerebellum or specifically an infarct of the right pica territory. At this point, with all of the um, imaging and the diagnoses and the fact that she had this bilateral blurred vision, we at this time were involved and were consulted. So you can see at the initial exam, her vision wasn't too bad, 2020, 2025. Uh, she had no RAPD, her EOMs were full, and she was orthophoric and primary gaze. Her anterior slit lamp exam was pretty unremarkable. However, on the dilated fundus exam, um, at, done at the bedside, we saw that there was severe bilateral optic nerve head edema. We couldn't take fundus photos at this time just because of her condition and where we were examining her. Um, but a week and a half later, we, we were able to get some photos. At this time, there's already a significant improvement in the bilateral disc edema. We can still see here there's some remaining um, peripapillary hemorrhages, which we did see on the initial consultation as well. On ancillary testing, you can see that the OCT showed um, a thickened RNFL and the visual fields pretty unremarkable, just a bit of an enlarged blind spot. So we diagnosed her with papilledema secondary to her extensive cerebral venous sinus thromboses. She started on plasma exchange and over the next couple of days and couple of weeks, she clinically stabilized. She was transferred to the ward and eventually discharged home. She was discharged home on oral fondaparinex, which again is a non-heparin anticoagulant and also has to be on lifelong prednisone though because of her adrenal insufficiency. So let's talk a little bit more about vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VIT. As its name suggests, it's characterized by this thrombocytopenia and thrombosis following vaccination against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, it's often seen, in, not often seen, but more commonly seen in the adenovirus-based um, vaccines, but there have been some cases in the mRNA vaccines. It typically affects healthy people. They tend to be younger than 55 years old. There's a female preponderance. Um, onset of symptoms is usually about four to 24 days after vaccination. And again, it's characterized by these thromboses, but in particular, thromboses at unusual sites. So like the splanchic venous system, hepatic veins, portal veins, and uh, dural venal sinuses, which we saw in this patient. There have been some case reports looking at CVST cases among the VIT cases, and you can see it's a relatively high percentage among the VIT cases. Most of, the, most of these patients presented with headaches, and so it's a, an important thing to recognize just because the mortality rates in these patients is quite high. It approaches about 50%. So just to summarize, we're often told about these COVID vaccine side effects that are common, like pain at the injection site, headache, fever, chills, fatigue, nausea, myalgias or arthralgias. So typical flu-like symptoms, which are common maybe a day or um, two after you get the vaccine. However, if we focus a little bit more on the headaches and especially the headaches that um, arise more like a week after or more days after you get the vaccine, that is something that is not common and requires further investigation. If a patient presents like this, you at least have to do ophthalmoscopy to rule out optic disc edema. And so the takeaways here are that we have to maintain a high index of suspicion for VIT. If a patient is complaining about a headache and they had a recent vaccine um, and we do the, uh, and we look at their nerve and we do notice that they have optic disc edema, then this warrants urgent imaging and uh, blood work to rule out VIT and in particular CVST. Again, because the mortality rate is so high. For patients who have had the AstraZeneca vaccine, it is recommended that their second dose isn't AstraZeneca. Um, however, at least there, there have been at least 36 case reports of dural, uh, dural sinus thromboses after the mRNA vaccine, so things like the Pfizer vaccine. Although most of our population has already been vaccinated against COVID, booster shots are coming and might require more than one dose. So it's just important to keep these lessons that we've learned from this case in mind, since VIT and CVST is a do not miss diagnosis. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for presenting the case. Again, uh, we thought that maybe this is just an historic case because AstraZeneca is not given any longer, but there are quite a few reports of um, not necessarily VIT, but uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in patients 
uh, post mRNA vaccinations as well. So um, we will now move to our last case, which will be presented by Dr. Michelli himself. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning. So the last case today I'm going to present is a uh, persistent headache after vaccination. So this was a 71-year-old woman who was referred to ophthalmology by her family doctor for transient vision loss in her right eye. She was known to be healthy and on no medication. She received her second dose of her COVID vaccine, which was the Pfizer um, on June 11 of this year. And then the next day she developed new right headaches, mainly on the right side and in the temporal area. This was unusual for her because she never had regular headaches. The next two weeks she felt more unwell and fatigued than usual. So she felt that something was definitely not right um, with her health. Initially, her headaches were thought to be vaccine related and her, vac her family doctor recommended Tylenol and some blood work to check her TSH and CBC. Uh, on the CBC, it was normal, except her platelets were a little high. Two weeks after the onset of her headache, she had sudden vision loss in her right eye for about a couple of minutes while she was watching TV. Her vision returned to normal pretty quickly. However, this scared her and she presented to the emergency room. In the emergency room, given her headaches, and uh, we just had the, a recent talk on um, that they did do a CTV of her head, but because of the transient vision loss, they also did a CT and CTA of head and neck, which were normal, and she was referred to stroke neurology, who performed a stroke workup. She reviewed um, her symptoms with her family doctor after she left the emergency room, and she was referred to us in ophthalmology. So when we saw her, her visual acuity was 20-20 in each eye, her pupils were equal, intraocular pressure was normal, and her anterior segment examination was normal. However, when we performed a dilated fundus examination, we saw a single cotton wool spot along the superior arcade in the right eye, which we can see with our cartoon here. Because of our suspicion for a particular condition, we uh, had the patient go immediately to the lab to obtain a CBC, ESR, and CRP, and you can see that her platelets were even higher than before. Although her ESR was not um, particularly elevated, her CRP was very, very elevated at 175, where normal is less than five. So in summary, we have this 71-year-old woman who has new onset headache, fatigue, and transient vision loss, which was noted after her second Pfizer vaccine. We found a cotton wool spot on examination, and we have very significantly elevated CRP and platelets. So this is not really a diagnostic dilemma. Everyone here knows to think about giant cell arteritis. And so we started the patient on steroids and we performed a temporal artery biopsy. And the biopsy was diagnostic of giant cell arteritis since it showed the uh, typical findings. Um, so here's a representative photograph where you can see the internal elastic lamina here, which is disrupted. And here we had a bit of an unusual feature of fibrinoid necrosis. And although this is unusual in giant cell arteritis, it can happen. Here's a blow up of the image. So here's the classic giant cell that we can see on the inlet. We have some histiocytes here. Um, and we also have a bit of an unusual feature that they're eosinophils. And although this is rare, it can happen in GCA. And you can see here the uh, breakdown of the internal elastic lamina. And so this patient was started on prednisone, one milligram per kilogram in the eye clinic. And as we expect in giant cell arteritis, her headache rapidly improved. Her vision remained normal, fortunately, and uh, this case was co-managed with rheumatology. And you can see over the subsequent months, her CRP returned back to almost normal levels. So autoimmune disease is a well-recognized rare side effect of um, vaccinations. And so if we look in the literature, there have been some previous cases of GCA after vaccination. So this was a case of a 72-year-old, or sorry, 79-year-old woman who had bilateral sudden vision loss and biopsy proven GCA. The vision loss happened two days after the va Pfizer vaccine. The follow-up here was not reported. 
But I just want to emphasize that it, this is not a COVID vaccination specific um, issue. Um, GCA and PMR have been reported after vaccination of, uh, for other viruses. So there have certainly been case reports of GCA and PMR after influenza vaccination. And the paper here on the left suggests that there was an interaction with certain um, HLA um, haplotypes. We presented a case at Grand Rounds a couple of years ago where we had this very severe case of GCA and scalp necrosis after um, varicella zoster virus vaccination. However, it's also important to realize that even though we're, we're seeing this after vaccination, GCA can, be, uh, can happen after infections themselves, particularly viral infections. And it's, uh, it has been thought and still thought that a, an infectious trigger may account for some cases of GCA. Um, so on the left here, there have been GCA-like vasculitides that have been reported after COVID-19. And on the right here is a case that we saw the patient got that had giant cell arteritis and bilateral no light perception vision after herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And so even though we're showing cases uh, of vaccination, it can also happen after infection itself. So the pathophysiology is thought to involve um, activation of the dendritic cell, and then this activates these T cells and the macrophages release various cytokines. And so the, the thought, the mechanism that's thought to be most at play here is either molecular mimicry, where these viral or bacterial antigens trigger an immune response against autoantigens. It's also possible that these uh, microbial agents release, release self-sequestered self-antigens from toast tissue and then that activates the downstream immune response. So this case is just a short one, but it's important to understand that autoimmunity is a well-recognized but rare side effect of vaccines. Even though headache is common after vaccination, if it persists beyond several days, um, you should think about alternative causes, including uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and certainly in older individuals, uh, giant cell arteritis. And just because someone hasn't permanently lost vision, you still need to remember GCA, the differential diagnosis, um, because a lot of these times the patients just end up in the stroke clinic and GCA is not considered. An eye exam can be helpful in these patients with transient vision loss because you can see supported, supportive findings on the fundus examination, such as a cotton wool spot in giant cell arteritis. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, that was a great case. And um, again, the purpose of our rounds today was not to show you everything that we have seen that was related to COVID, but to share some cases which we thought were very instructive. So in summary, we showed you a case of uh, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. So the purpose of that was to show you that this is a rare condition that can present with a normal eye exam, yet the visual loss can be the most glaring manifestation for that. We showed you the most common inciting factors for that. We talked about a case of um, acute liberal hereditary optic neuropathy and raised the, the fact that the, um, the pandemic has unfortunately really changed uh, our habits and our lives and people are definitely smoking and drinking more than usual. And um, I was actually shocked that yesterday in clinic we saw a case very similar to this lady also. Unilateral visual loss was with a Sika central scotoma and the lady who started smoking now three times her usual level. We don't have the confirmation yet. So then we showed you, um, we, we Jenny showed you the case of post-vaccine-induced -vac thrombocytopenia. Uh, which is definitely probably a very unlikely event after the mRNA vaccines. But again, we raised the fact that dural sinus thrombosis has certainly been reported after Pfizer vaccinations. And then Dr. Michelli showed us the case of questionable molecular mimicry um, where the giant cell arteritis was diagnosed in the patient um, fairly shortly after receiving Pfizer vaccinations. And he showed you, uh, showed us some uh, clinical pearls on uh, recognizing um, signs of giant cell arteritis and ophthalmic exam, even when the visual vision is actually normal. 
So we will, uh, if you, everybody has time, we will do a little post test, really focusing on the most important messages from all the cases that were presented to you. And let me see if uh, this is a question number one. Um, again, I'm going to read it to you, and then you read it yourself. Um, which of the following can be the inciting event for this entity that we spoke about, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome? Could it be preeclampsia? Could it be post-transplant anti-rejection medication? Could it be COVID-19 virus, severe hypertension, or all of the above? So nice triad, but you can't fool them. <laughs> Everybody, perfect. Never uh, seen that before. So there you go. Amazing. So we've done something right. Again, the purpose of that case was not only to show you that uh, COVID-19 can be the trigger for this condition called PRESS, but to raise awareness of that condition and the fact that we as ophthalmologists can be really the first observers of that and just be aware that it exists. Uh, let's go on to the question number two. Yeah. Uh, okay, which of the following, this is a bit of a tricky question, which of the following statement is true about Lieber's heredity optic neuropathy? It almost never occurs in older adults. It always presents with unilateral visual loss. It can present with unilateral optic neuropathy without relative afferent pupillary defect. It is only associated with three known mitochondrial mutations. So just think about what you want to choose here. And um, some of these distractors are kind of close to the truth, but not the ultimate truth. So let's see. Um, let's see, what are, how do people vote it? And most of you chose the correct response, recognizing the, um, um, the, uh, the mistake and other statements. So, so of course we showed you that it definitely can occur in older adults. And my personal belief, it's probably widely um, underdiagnosed in older adults. Um, it can most of the time presents with unilateral and then sequential visual loss in the fellow eye, but we've certainly seen cases that present at the same time in both eyes. Uh, it certainly can present with unilateral optic neuropathy, and we showed you um, and discussed about the peculiarities of this particular condition, about why there might not be a relative afferent pupillary defect. And this is really uh, the only acute optic neuropathy, asymmetric optic neuropathy that can present without an RAPD. Okay, and let's, let's move to the next question. Um, thank you, Amandeep. So vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia is associated with what? high platelet count, low platelet count, high white blood cell count, or low white blood cell count. And again, remember Jenny's presentation, this is a very peculiar condition, um, and so we'll let you think about the answer, but remember this is the thrombosis in the presence of something unusual. Um, typically we associate thrombosis with obviously high platelet count, but in this particular, case there are actually specific specific antibodies against the receptor on the surface of the platelet that can subsequently cause platelet aggregation and thrombosis through a very thrombosis in unusual sites so it is associated with low platelet counts and this particular antibodies uh, against uh, the receptor on the surface of the platelets um, okay thank you and then let's i'm going to let's do the next question uh, um, what's the next question? It's coming up, I promise. Um, what is the best approach to the patient that you suspect might have Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy? And this is a bit of a self-serving question for us, but uh, would you want to bring it up? Because I think it's important. What are you going to do? You're going to order urgent MRI of the brain and orbits. Are you going to urgently refer this patient to a neurologist? Are you going to give an urgent phone call to your neuro-ophthalmologist or are you going to observe this patient? So knowing there's probably not much you can do. Uh, again, while you're thinking about the options, um, everything that we've presented to you, we presented you know, a bunch of rare disorders. And even though um, 
it might be tempting to take care of these patients yourself. I mean, there's a lot of subtleties involved in taking care of them and um, counseling them and doing genetic counseling and uh, counseling to them about what will happen and uh, suggesting certain medications to them. So again, we really ask you that you give us a call and um, let us take care of these patients because there are uh, a bunch of subtleties that can be done that can improve their prognosis and um, overall help these patients. Um, let's move on to the next question. Well, on that note, we're, we're, I will just say we're very lucky to have you guys because you're very accessible. Thank so you. we can actually get patients in urgently. So that is nice. Thank we you. We'd love to see urgent patients. Let's see the next um, next case, next question. A pathophysiology of posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome is related to what? Is it an embolus in the posterior cerebral artery? Is this an atherosclerotic plaque in the vertebral artery? Is this somehow related to endothelial dysfunction or is it related to systemic hypotension? And again, want to underline this is a rare condition. Obviously, you uh, we cannot know everything about everything, but this is just kind of a little introduction and a prelude to, again, because we can often be the first people and first observers to see these patients. So I think it's important to have a general understanding of what causes this. And again, this is a condition that causes extravasation of fluid uh, from the vessels, predominantly in the occipital and posterior lobes, as SAF1 alluded to, because they have poor autoregulation. And again, it's related presumably to endothelial dysfunction. And again, as opposed to stroke, where the pathophysiology is intracellular ischemia and cell death, this condition is, is reversible because it is not associated with cell death and is associated rather with extravasation of fluid. And therefore, the cells are intact. And when the extracellular edema reserve resolves, the cells can resume, resume their normal function. Therefore, it is important to recognize it. Thank you. And let's, I think we only have uh, two questions left. Let's go on to the next question. Um, thank you, my dear. I know it requires 10, 20 clicks. What test will you consider in the 70 year old patient? with persistent headache and fatigue after their COVID-19 vaccination? Will you order an MRI of the brain? Will you order a CBC, ESR, and CRP? Will you go for OCT of the macular or CT scan of the chest for perhaps looking for pulmonary emboli? What, what are you going to do? Um, and again, remember the, um, the, 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 the case that Dr. Michelli presented talking about this very issue. And uh, several of these tests were done, but what were the tests that yielded the, the answer in this case? And uh, perfect, everybody has paid attention. You wanna look for inflammatory markers because giant celluritis has certainly been reported um, after uh, COVID-19 and other vaccinations as Dr. Michelli told us about. Um, so we have to be mindful of that, probably related to molecular mimicry. Uh, let's move on to the last question. Um, so far, everybody done really well. Uh, I mean, I think it's important to do the post-test because it helps us kind of recap and focus on the most important messages that we wanted to convey to you. Uh, what ocular findings would support a diagnosis of giant cell arthritis in the patient with new headaches? And I love this question, it is so good. Flame-shaped hemorrhages throughout the fundus, a disc at risk in either eye, a presence of an isolated or several cotton wool spots, or bilateral severe optic disc edema. So as you're pondering the answer to that question, um, again, I want you to think about the fact that giant cell arthritis is essentially, it is a vasculitis. So then as a vasculitis, what it does, the main pathology the vasculitis produces is obviously ischemia. There is inflammation in the blood vessel wall causing the reduction in the, um, in the cell, in the lumen in the middle of the cell. So eventually the blood flow, flow will cease 
and perfect. Everybody has paid attention. And cotton wool spots, cotton wool spot is sort of our indirect indication of overall retinal ischemia. That the retina is inner retina is not getting enough blood 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 flowing to it, presumably due to the vasculitis affecting the uh, the central retinal artery um, before um, it branches into the and branch retinal arteries at the retina. So cotton wool spot, again, when you're asked to screen a patient for giant cellular arteritis, look carefully for the presence of cotton wool spots. And as you saw in Dr. Michelli's case, it was really not super obvious, but it was certainly there if you looked for it. And that kind of helped clinch the diagnosis. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I think we've attempted to answer everybody's questions on uh, in the chat. Um, with specifically Nancy Epstein asking a good question about the size of the stimulus in the static versus kinetic perimetry. Um, and uh, we said that in, in the Goldman perimeter, you can, you can change the size of the target at any point. You can also change the tar size of the target in, in static perimeter, but only really once in the beginning of the test, that the entire test is performed with the same yeah. stimulus size, which is almost always size three. Um, again, thank you again for joining us. We hope we entertain you and we hope that you learned something. And thank you for um, all the wonderful residents for spending so much time preparing for the rounds and going through the dry rounds and um, really making sure that we relay our messages to you. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you for the great talks today. It was a very, very informative session, great presentation. So uh, thank you to Ed and Jonathan, and Safon, Kirill, and Jenny. Really just a fantastic round this morning. So we'll end it there, uh, unless there's any parting thoughts from anyone else here. Perfect. Enjoy your Friday, guys.